Today, it's great to have Richard Ryan on the podcast. Dr. Ryan is a professor at the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education at Australian Catholic University, North Sydney, and Professor Emeritus in Psychology at the University of Rochester. Dr. Ryan is a clinical psychologist and co-developer of self-determination theory, one of the leading theories of human motivation. He is among the most cited researchers in psychology and social sciences today, ranking among the top 1% of researchers in the field. Dr. Ryan has been recognized as one of the eminent psychologists of the modern era, listed among the top 20 most influential industrial organizational psychologists, and has been honored with many distinguished career awards. He is co-author with Edward Deasy of the book Self-Determination Theory, Basic Psychological Needs in Motivation, Development, and Wellness. Rich, it's so great to finally have a sit down and have a chat with you. Yeah, Scott's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. And, you know, I want to just go back to kind of trace the development of your thinking and, and just who you are a little bit. You know, why? how did you get into the field of psychology in the first place? Ooh, Scott, you know, those kind of questions are always pretty complicated. It was a, for me, it was a circuitous route, but uh, I suppose this part would interest you a lot. I was a philosophy major when I was an undergraduate uh, and oh. uh, I had a strong interest in uh phenomenology in particular and issues of freedom and dialectics and uh, so that guaranteed that I was unemployed upon graduation and uh, so <laughs> the result of that was you know I was looking for a job and my wife was working in a, a local facility for developmental disabilities and she said there's a job for an aide open there and I went there they sent me to the wrong interview and I ended up uh, directing a program for uh, helping people get out of the institution and live independently and that mm -hmm. got me really interested in the issues of motivation and uh, intervention. And that led me to get back into psychology. Cool. And you did your uh, PhD in, in what, like, in what discipline of psychology? I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist. Clinical? So clinical. And I got yeah. my PhD at the University of Rochester in clinical. I was for many years the director of clinical training at Rochester uh, until I mm -hmm. went to Australia. Excellent. And what was your like dissertation title? Hmm. I, it was a really boring title. I can't tell you what it was, but they all are. Uh, but they I was basically are. testing the idea that uh, ego involvement will undermine your intrinsic motivation. So the more your ego's on the line, uh, the less you'll be intrinsically motivated. So that was my my dissertation. Now that's really interesting because. Um, that I mean, that's a great obvious precursor to the more modern day work that you've done on motivation, and so that really did start in grad school. Um, so, who was your who was your advisor? Well, when I started in grad school, uh, my area was uh, clinical neuropsychology, so I was doing a lot of work in evoke potential uh, research, and that, that was with Raphael Klorman, who was a great advisor for me, but. Uh, I converted, I guess, uh, Ed DC and I were running Gestalt groups together around the city of Rochester at the time, and we were, um, you know, good friends as clinicians, um, and then we started to talk theory, and he was already doing experiments on intrinsic motivation, and the two of us came together, so my dissertation really had moved over to uh, our beginnings of self-determination theory. So you've really known Edward DC a long time. The, oh, uh, I didn't even realize it went back to grad school. Oh, no, Ed and I have been friends since 1977. So <laughs> we have a long history together. <laughs> that is amazing. So, you know, the, the, a lot of this, well, all of this stuff, uh, this research went, came after Abraham Maslow's passing. Um, I, um, as you know, as anyone who listens to my podcast knows, I'm a big fan of Abraham Maslow and the humanistic psychology era. Uh, and he, you know, really thought a lot about motivation, but he never used the uh, the expression intrinsic extrinsic. Right. You know, he, he never he never talked about that distinction. When did that distinction start to crop up in psychology? And uh, uh, you know, who were some of your major influencers early on in your career? Well, I'd say a big influencer, and this also applies to uh, DC, is uh, Richard de Charms. Richard de Charms wrote a book in 1968 called Personal Causation. Uh, yeah. In that book, he really describes the difference between feeling like an origin, like you're behind and, and engaged in your behavior versus a pawn, like you're being pushed around by external forces. So he was an attribution theorist in the tradition of Heider. He was also a psychodynamic thinker. Uh, I would say he, he was a big influencer and he did work on, uh, he discussed intrinsic motivation and he even discussed the hypothesis that rewards and ego involvement would undermine it, although he didn't you know, do much work on that himself. 
uh, it was really Ed who picked up that theme. So I would say it was around. Uh, Robert White was a big influence on us. Uh, I once got the opportunity to meet with Robert White, and he's you know well known for his idea of effectiveness motivation and competence motivation. Uh, so I'd say between the charms and his ideas about autonomy and uh, um, Robert White and his ideas about competence, those are kind of the theoretical forerunners for our work. Cool. And I'm, I, because you did say, you did mention you studied philosophy. So I am curious who were some of your, uh, philosopher influences, especially in your thinking about autonomy, because that's a topic that, well, obviously philosophers have been thinking about for a really long time with issues of free will. And, uh, I'm just curious if you, you immersed yourself in the philosophy of mind, you know, or the existential philosophy literature at all before you, you got into the even into the field of psychology. Yeah, I'd say that was there before my interest in psychology. So I was a in, that's in awesome college a student of Husserl. I was really interested in European phenomenology and existentialism, and in particular, there was you know there's an early phenomenologist whose name is Alexander Fonder, and he did a lot of work on the whole idea of uh, what he called will or self determination. Uh, from a phenomenological point of view, mm -hmm. and so he was he was certainly an early influence on me. I also I was steeped in the philosophy of Paul Ricoeur, who was a later phenomenological existential thinker. Um, I had a lot of uh, interest in the work of Sartre, uh, but also uh, analytic philosophy to some extent, the work of Harry Frankfurt on, uh, on uh, free will mm. uh, and autonomy has been really important. So um, self-determination theory, I think, has always wanted to be well anchored and conversant uh, with, its, uh, with its philosophical underpinnings. I think there's too few theories today that really uh, explicitly state their ontologies and epistemologies, and I think well, that's something that we we strongly want to do. And uh, this this has been there from the beginning. Yeah, it's it, that's evident, and and that's a great that's a great feature, so to say, so to speak, of 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 your self determination theory. Um, be, even before we we get into the nuts and bolts of the theory and um, things surrounding that, I want to stay on the philosophy topic for a second because this is a topic that very much interests me. You know, I had a I had a, a two part series debate with Sam Harris for this podcast about uh, free will. And uh, uh, do you follow Sam Harris at all? Have you ever? I, I don't. I don't. That's fine. Well, that's your excuse <laughs> for that. But he uh, he he he's very much uh, believes we don't have free will. Um, and, it's usually, it's usually uh, a straw man argument. It's usually a definition of free will that no one would ever want anyway. Uh, <laughs> so so I'm pretty skeptical about anybody who argues the free will idea because they usually set up some kind of ridiculous model of what free will would look like. Like. There's no prior causes. There's no prior thought. There's no prior input. Right. It has to come ex nihilo. And of course, no events in the universe happen that way. So they win. If that's what free will is, <laughs> they win. Yeah. I hear you, brother. I hear you, brother. Well, there, there's a definition. There is a certain definition one could propose, as he does, that, you know, he's right in, in, the, in that sense, in the sense he's talking about. But I do think there's a, there's a free will worth wanting. I think that the kind of uh, self-determination you talk about in your research is a free will worth wanting. I think Daniel Dennett, you know, the, the philosopher of mind who is, uh, is a compatibilist would, would agree, you know, uh, with, with that is. So I do want to know, like your conceptualization of self-determination, like what is it? You know, before we get to the nuts and bolts of the needs and and the nuances of the theory, let's just talk about self-determination for a sec, because I think that's an interesting uh, of, in its in and of itself of what does that mean among humans? Mm -hmm. What are we well, determining? You know, we, we could translate it into some <laughs> other terms like self-regulation. You know, self-determination mm. is when you know what you're doing is something that you feel that you're regulating and in other words that it's, you're also a behavior that you stand behind or self-endorse this is why it aligns with the phenomenological view of self-determination because when you act with self-determination you're acting in a way where you're willing to do it and you do it volitionally and therefore you can be wholeheartedly engaged in what you're up to um, so in in kind of that that briefest form self-determination is true volition True volition. So there's a lot of things that can arise that can pull me away from, uh, or even fool me into thinking I'm, I'm, I have volition when I, when I really don't. Um, I'm fascinated with the phenomenon of cults, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm fascinated with the phenomenon of mind control. Yeah. Um, so I guess you can have external coercion and you can have, you can have internal coercion, you know, people with OCD, um, you know, people with lots of things, a lot of competing, you know, psychopathologies and things that are, they're inner, um, taking them away from, 
yeah you know i would say their higher self so so i, I think that uh, and you're, maybe you're there's some, right yeah you're just right scott which is that it's not parallel to the distinction between internal and external because you can have heteronymous forces that are within you can have your own interjects you can have your own internalized stigmas and pressures and biases that actually take you away from uh, self-determination and autonomy so the the threats to autonomy are not just external they're also internal yeah, and Carl and Carl Rogers talked about that introjection. I think is the phrase he used. Yeah, so that, that's certainly the, the case. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Do you use it as adapt adapting it from Carl Rogers or just a coincidence? No, actually, you know, Carl Rogers also adapted it from where I did, which is from psychoanalytic theory. Uh, when we talk about an mm. interject, you're talking about a partially assimilated uh, internalization. Uh, and uh, and Roger meant it in the same way. Um, you know, if we cool. if I was to trace it where I got the term from, it would be from my psychoanalytic training, and particularly from the work of Roy Schaefer, uh, who who really did talk about a continuum of motivations, um, not too dissimilar from what we did, but you know, we we adopted it without the same psychoanalytic assumptions. This is great. Okay, so can you tell our listeners a little bit? Uh, can you go through the motivational continuum? Let's start with like just going through the motions. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, when, far, you, when, you think, far yeah. when you think about uh, any action you have, when you ask people, why are you doing what you're doing? There's a whole variety of answers people might give. One answer might be, I'm being forced to do it or compelled to do it by forces that are outside me. Um, and that would be, you know, coercion and it would be a form of being externally regulated. I, they're making me do it. Um, I, I could also be uh, seduced into doing something with a carrot that's riding in front of me or a reward. Uh, I'm now doing it for the reward. So it's still an external force that's driving me. But here it's an appetitive force. We call both of those external regulation. That's when your motivation is dependent on either the external uh, pressure or the external rewards that are out there. And if those weren't there, your motivation would go away. Uh, the, another kind of motivation is, well, why are you doing that? Well, because I think I should or I'd feel bad about myself if I didn't or, uh, you know, uh, my, uh, I feel proud of myself if I do this thing. We call those things interjection. Because those are internal rewards and punishments that are driving your behavior, the fear of anxiety or shame or uh, the ego boost of, uh, of uh, you know, inflating yourself by feeling really great. Um, those things are also motivating forces that we call interjection. And they're not very autonomous either because we can be pushed around just as you were just saying uh, by those interjects. You know, my shoulds can make me do a lot of things that are not really what I value. Still, again, we can do things because uh, uh, we're uh, valuing them. We actually believe in them. So, you know, I might do something like collect money for a cause I care about. It's no fun. It's not interesting, but I truly value it. So I volitionally and willingly do it. And we would call this mm. identification because you're identified with your goal and your aim in that case. And that's also very volitional and highly autonomous. And finally, you know, we talk about intrinsic motivation. Now we're doing this is when you do something just because it's inherently enjoyable and interesting to you to do. Uh, so it's also fully volitional. And so you can see here we move from being externally controlled all the way up to being fully volitional. And this is why we call it a continuum of autonomy. But it has lots of way stations along the line uh, of different types of motives. Uh, the further out you up on that continuum in your motivation, the better the outcomes typically are, the higher your well-being, the better your performance, uh, the more congruent you are in action, the less conflicted. So you know, many good things happen from being more on the more autonomous end of that motivation continuum. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Um, and then you have like a, a test that like people, like employees and companies can take to like, or, or is it sort of do you, have you developed any instruments? Well, we yeah, we've developed a lot of instruments, and some of them are for mm. uh, research use. Uh, you know, because our research mm. instruments tend to be longer, and because they have to get through the gauntlet of of, uh, of the psychometrics journals demand. But then we do a lot of work in industry, and there we use things that are really practical measures. You know, I, I have a, a company that I started with Scott Rigby that's called Motivation Works, and in there we measure what we call motivation quality very quickly with employees. But it's, you know, it's basically asking them what are the drivers of your work on your job, 
and the, to the extent that they're more external, you see lower quality, more motivation, less, you know, more absenteeism, uh, more, you know, uh, less, less good organizational behavior, uh, poor performance. You see the opposite. The more people are really intrinsically motivated and identified with their work uh, goals. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, the one, one question I wanted to ask you, um, on this, about this motivational continuum was, uh, Samir Nura Muhammad's work at Penn. Um, he has found that a great motivating force, and I have found this personally in my life, a great motivating force is, uh, the underdog, uh, narrative, um, feeling like you have something to prove to someone who doesn't, who doesn't believe in you, but you b- still believe in yourself. You know, um, and I was wondering, like, where is that on the motivational continuum? I mean, that's probably like an extra extrinsic. I put, I put it right in there with as an interject. I'm going to show them. So now, you know, you're being reactive. Plus, you're also trying to live up to a standard that's really being externally defined in that case. Uh, you know, this is like. But it feels so good. But it feels so good to crush your competition once who doesn't believe in you. Uh, it may. It seems like a pretty empty goal. I mean, if that's if that's the kind of basis of somebody's overall motivation, I think then it's pretty limited as a goal. You know, like I would rather not have somebody become a, a Ph.D. in psychology because they want to prove to their mom that they're good. I'd rather that they <laughs> loved the field of psychology and cared about the content of that field, that they were more concerned with their understanding of the field than the grades that they got or the credentials they attained. I mean, these these kind of I'm not saying that those are not motivating goals, but they're uh, kind of an impoverished form of motivation because the goal is is pretty superficial. And then um, it, it can be pretty easily undermined. I've been on the search for the perfect mattress for the past few years. And let me tell you, I've gone through so many mattresses. My friends have made fun of me because for so long I didn't actually own a mattress. I just went through so many free trials. I had no idea what it feels like to be well rested until I tried a Helix mattress. Are you not able to sleep because of stress and anxiety? It's definitely understandable given the current state of the world. Psychological research shows that high quality sleep is so important for stress and well-being though. Lack of quality sleep can affect your memory, increase mood swings, and even can lead to depression. While a number of factors contribute to poor sleep quality, your choice of mattress can really matter a lot. Helix Sleep makes personalized mattresses right here in America and ships them straight to your door with free, no contact delivery, free returns, and a 100 night sleep trial. To choose a mattress, Helix made a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. If you like a mattress that's really soft or firm, you sleep on your side or your back or your stomach, or you sleep really hot, with Helix, there's a specific mattress for each and everyone's unique taste. Personally, I took the quiz and I was matched with the Helix Sunset Lux because I wanted something that felt soft and I sleep mostly on my side all night. I've got to say, I love my Helix mattress. I wake up really feeling refreshed and ready to work out or start my work. Also, I've been tracking my sleep with a device and my sleep score is consistently in the good or excellent range. This is a new thing for me, so it's really exciting to finally get high quality sleep. I really do love Helix, but you don't have to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ, Wired Magazine, and Apartment Therapy. Just go to helixsleep.com psychology, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you probably will. Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash psychology. Get up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash psychology. That's helixsleep.com slash psychology. Okay, now back to the show. I think that I would push back on that for a little bit and say that well, maybe at certain points in people's lives, it, it serves a really good purpose. You know, when I was younger, um, I was at special ed as a kid and, um, you know, no, none of my teachers or anyone believed in my intellectual potential. Um, and I had to generate this kind of FU attitude from within. I mean, it's the only thing that saved me, Ryan. You know what I mean? It's the only thing that saved me to be like, you know, what I'm going to prove to them that I do have some kind of intelligence. Now, I do agree that a more mature 
or, you know, intrinsic to the right of your continuum someday, you know, you want to morph and, 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 and which I did thank, thankfully, I don't still feel like I need to prove anything to anybody, yeah. <laughs> but, but I do think as a child, it served, it served uh, its purpose. Well, you know, again, I'm not going to argue that it's not a motivation. It is, it sits in the middle of our continuum. It's something that shows some, uh, some some energizing functions. But think about it, Scott. Wouldn't it have been better had you had people who actually did care about uh, where you were headed, believed in you, supported you for that growth? I mean, there, there would have been a much nicer motivational path to the same outcomes uh, than the, the one that you outlined. And I'm not saying that know. You, you had to compensate for some bad motivational circumstances. And, and Honestly, I don't know because um, <laughs> Samir's research, and, I, and I'd, love to, I'd love to send you this paper that Samir just published, this paper. He's at Warden. He actually contrasted two motivations uh, narratives. One is the underdog, but the other is the favorite narrative, which is like people always believed in me and, you know, and then I made it. And he found that the underdog one like increased performance better than, than the other one. So that kind of like turns on its head a little bit. It, you know the the narratives we tell ourselves. You know maybe some are. I can believe that. In the, I can believe that in a short term experiment. I can believe that. Or I, I I totally get it as a dynamic. I don't think it's a sustainable dynamic as sustainable. a way of making a living and uh, being being really engaged in your field. If it's if it's all about your ego proving, I think it's it's gonna not sustain itself. Did you see the Last Dance by any chance? No, I didn't. Michael Jordan has is known for uh well, of course you know who Michael Jordan is right yeah he is known for creating imaginary uh foes to, to keep him sustain so to him I would I wish I to get I'd push back <laughs> at certain contexts maybe like NBA sports you know like it might be sustainable to like keep like you know being like, I'm going to prove, I'm going to prove them wrong. You know, it might be, might be. Actually I don't, I don't think you'd explain Michael Jordan's persistence and success by that motive. That would Alone. Be, that'd be Alone. Like, yeah. Michael, my, I'm not saying he doesn't create a game for himself and doesn't, you know, pump himself up in these ways. Those sound like ways yeah. to get himself intrinsically motivated to present himself with challenge to, um, mm. but I, I, I can't imagine that that would be a, a basis for it. The career of Michael Jordan's. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised, but I I do think that like not maybe not that alone. Like he he obviously does have intrinsic love yeah. for the game, and yeah, I mean without the intrinsic love for the the game, you know, it seems like hard to be sustainable. Um, I mean, can't you have like multiple of these motives at once? Uh, actually, you know? our self termination model says you almost always do. So, you know, when I'm involved in my work, you know, to some extent, it's intrinsically motivated. To some extent, it's coming out of value. To some extent, I'm interjected and need to do well, <laughs> you know, beat myself up if I wrote a poor article. So, you know, you have multiple motives always going. And what we look at is where's the relative autonomy in that, you know, because it's a balance of those things. Um, but they, they certainly coexist and they coexist within every almost within every act. You know, there's hardly any humans are messy. Pure interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have multiple motives usually um, going, and uh, but when some become predominant, it can undermine the quality of our overall actions. Mm. And that's again, really I get that. back to. I, I don't mm. doubt that you know people pump themselves up with little uh, ego games like that. I don't think it's mm. if that's where your main motivation is sitting, it's not going to end up in high quality motivation over time. Mm. Okay, so let's go into some of your, uh, the needs, the major needs of self-determination theory and how you selected them. You know, why'd they make the cut? <laughs> mm. Well, you know, we didn't start out with a theory of basic psychological needs. We started out with a, a narrower theory of what are the things that facilitate or undermine intrinsic motivation. Mm. And we found that contexts that supported people's autonomy and supported people's feelings of competence were the things that really drove intrinsic motivation. And then when we started to look at internalization and what are the things that uh, lead people to deeply internalize the values of their culture, the people around them, it was feeling of autonomy that they, you know, the reading of autonomy supported that they could feel competent to do the things that um, were being asked of them. And then third, that they felt closely connected to others. So autonomy, competence and relatedness popped out really strongly for the basis of internalization. And as we were studying these things that feed into high quality motivation and all of our studies were showing that when you had autonomy competence and relatedness you also had high well-being 
all the indices of flourishing. And that's when we started to move toward a theory of basic needs that a full functioning person is, is, has their volition, has that sense of efficacy and feel socially connected and uh, purposive in what they're doing. So those things congeal uh, in a full functioning person. So those, they seem like necessary conditions for wellness. And so, you know, as we've looked in settings like workplaces, classrooms, uh, health clinics, uh, psychotherapy settings, we see all three of those needs really being uh, um, potent uh, drivers of the, of the wellness outcomes that are there. So I, I can say really empirically we came to the th these as three basic needs. But there's also a deductive portion of it. Uh, SDT is what we call an organismic theory. It grows out of the organismic psychological tradition. And in that, you know, when you think about what is a, a healthy organism, it's an uh, organism that's moving in the direction of differentiation and integration, which means that it's moving in the direction of greater self-regulation of autonomy and greater effectiveness in its environment. And if it's a social organism, greater integration. So those three concepts, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, fall deductively out of organismic thinking, as well as inductively out of what we found in all of our research on motivation. How much did you sort of consult Maslow's writings on a basic, the basic needs? And, uh, um, you know, you, yeah, like there's no self-actualization as a specific need in your theory and uh, just wondering if like did you consider any of his well i think stuff? organismic theory says that there's an inherent and propensity towards integration which is very close to the self-actualization idea um and certainly roger's idea of self-actualization was also an integrative idea so i think there are some parallel ideas over there um you know for myself you know maslow was a an author I read as a kid, so, you know, because I was, I'm so much older, so for me, he was like a, a, a person I read as a teenager, and I wouldn't say he wasn't influential, but he was influential more in the sense of like pointing to possibilities in the field uh, than in terms of formal theory. Um, you know, I, I very much think that the, the humanistic spirit in focusing on self-actualization has some kinship with SDT's idea of an active individual who's moving in a direction of integration all the time so there are similarities yeah, spiritual I agree. Similarities. Yeah. oh i agree and I, I think the integration piece is so essential i was wondering how you incorporate the integration piece into self-determination theory because one could have um you know could score high in in the the needs uh for relatedness competence autonomy um but still not be particularly integrated as a whole human right i don't think that's so um, you know, again, when we're thinking about need satisfaction, if I think about a setting in which somebody has all three of those needs setting, it's almost by definition that they're integrated in their functioning there. Because if I have those th needs satisfied, that means I'm pursuing the things that matter to me, that I value, that interest me. So I have volition. Um, I have connection and social support because I have the relatedness and I'm feeling efficacious. I, you know, I can't see in that anything other than uh, a pretty integrated um, person. Are there any um, needs that that you're considering uh, adding to the picture? Um, yeah, I'll just ask that question. Have you, yeah. you know, considered? Well, you know, we've always had an open list. So, you know, we we came out with a tentative theory of uh, three basic needs uh, by the early '90s. We were sort of in that place, and we've always kept the list open for uh, people to nominate other things. Uh, one of my former students, Tim Casser at one time tried to uh, put security into the list. But as we, mm. as we looked at the need for security, we found that kind of in line with, uh, with Maslow's thinking here, it's really a deficit need. It's really something that rears its head when you don't have it. But if you have it, it it's not very prominent and it's not all that enhancing. So it doesn't predict wellness. It's kind of like a necessary but not sufficient condition for some things to happen in your life. So security was one that we tried to bring in to meet criteria, mm -hmm. but didn't meet those criteria. More recently, uh, Frank Martella from Finland mm -hmm. uh, joined our group in Rochester when I was still there. And, I love and he him. was interested in uh, benevolence and altruism as a possible basic psychological need. And I will say, you know, exploring that, the evidence has shown really how much of a, a wellness enhancer benevolence is. When people act with benevolence, they are typically doing so autonomously, so they're satisfying their autonomy need. They're typically feeling effective. 
So they're getting some competence needs, they're connecting with people, but they're also getting some kind of warm glow of benevolence, which has its own unique effect on wellness. And, uh, and we found that over and over again. So uh, although benevolence doesn't fit all the criteria we have for what a basic need is, it certainly is an enhancement, a wellness enhancer. And it's a big part of how people find meaning in life. Uh, so yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I, I support adding adding that to your list. Um, I, I don't know uh, if you if you have heard uh, about my book Transcend that mm-hmm. came out uh, recently. I have. Um, I have. I, I'd love to send you a copy and uh, perhaps we could compare and contrast and really nerd out someday yeah. um, and get in the weeds in a way that our listeners probably don't want to listen to right now. But, <laughs> but, you know, but you know my bottom, tendency bottom, is always to nerd out. My tendency is always to nerd out. So, you know, you have to stop me when I go there. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, no. I mean, tr- that's my that's my tendency, too. And um, I'd love to uh, maybe just discuss with you some uh, needs that I've added that, that aren't in your theory um, and maybe, uh, you know, you have good reasons for that and you know maybe i need to rethink things maybe you need you need to rethink things <laughs> who knows um but um uh one thing that well, i was really excited about the benevolence thing is i did add that as a separate need from the need for connection um i did separate those out in my in my revised hierarchy of needs um and i've been developing a scale with my colleagues called the light triad scale i don't know if you've come across that uh-huh. at all um <laughs> it's a great idea as, as opposed to the dark triad <laughs> yeah exactly have you come across it at all in the literature? I have not Scott so you'll have to okay, send I'll send you I'll send you that I'd be totally I'll send you that paper yeah. um, and yeah and I think that really does capture more well we call it a benevolent orientation you know towards others to I, don't know if you've, uh, I don't know if you've yeah. seen uh, we have a, a meta-analysis that shows that uh, pro-social you know behavior and anti-social behavior are strongly predicted in meta-analyses by autonomy and control. So when people have autonomy, they tend to be pro-social. We think of that as the default in human nature. Uh, and under controlled circumstances, they tend to be more anti-social. And I, I think it, uh, it fits with this, this overall idea. Did you know that every year, U.S. businesses waste billions of dollars because bad writing causes confusion, misses the mark, or just takes too long to get to the point? On the flip side, better writing always helps businesses win and impress customers, enhance brand perception, improve internal communication, and strengthen relationships with critical partners. Better, faster writing means better business, which is why your team needs WordTune. Going way beyond simple spelling and grammar correction, WordTune is the only AI-powered writing tool that understands meaning, offering writing suggestions that help anyone achieve clear and compelling writing. It's the ultimate writing tool to elevate your entire team's writing instantly. I was wondering how this thing works, so I gave it a try. I was having trouble finding the right way to phrase something and was pleased with the options WordTune gave me based on my own words. I particularly like that the suggestion sounded like something I'd actually say. WordTune also helped make some of my sentences sound less academic and flow better. It was kind of like having a real life writing editor sitting next to me all day long. It felt very comforting. When can your team use WordTune? WordTune improves performance on any project. Everything from internal emails to press releasing, sales outreach to customer services support, and so much more. You can use WordTune anywhere you're writing online, including Google Docs, Slack, Outlook Web, and WhatsApp. Are you learning to elevate your entire team's writing? My listeners can get a discount for their team today at wordtune.com slash psychology. WordTune improves writing efficiency up to four times. Better, faster writing means better business. Start writing with WordTune at wordtune.com slash psychology. I won't even go there about the uh, COVID masks, uh, people who and uh, pe- people who don't want to be controlled for having to wear masks or having to get vaccinations yeah. and uh, and what that controlling does to, to those people's personalities. We'll just not talk about that at all. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, yeah, so there's just, uh, I would, I would propose humble, and I say this humbly, I have the utmost of respect for your work, but I think maybe it'd be nice to consider adding the need for exploration as I, as I add in my revised hierarchy of needs, um, in, in your model, because I, we do find that is a separate need. Let me just um, say a couple of things it, about yeah. that though. I mean, I, I'm happy to consider all needs. But the problem with calling something like exploration a basic need is that it's really something that happens in certain domains and times and it doesn't cut across all of the types of things we typically explain with basic needs. 
when people are in an exploratory mode, they're typically getting a high satisfaction of the need for competence. When they're truly in exploratory mode, they have a lot of volition behind that. And so there's a lot of already basic need satisfaction going on in exploration. And so to have it be its own basic need, you'd have to say, well, exploration is part of all the different behaviors people engage in. And it's necessary I think it for is. all of those. And I think that's... The I think part. I could make a case that it is. Okay. Um, yeah. My colleague, Colin DeYoung, and I are, are writing a paper. Well, it's taking a long time to finish it, but the, how why the need for exploration is... I mean, it, it's it's aimless. It's aimless in a lot of ways and goalless. And I would actually I would actually argue that it's uh, separate, uh, clearly distinct from the need for competence and mastery. And, and I would even go so far, and I know you're going to totally disagree with me on this, and it's totally fine. Please feel free to disagree on anything I say. But I, I would actually make the case that the need for competence is tied to, to, to ego and self-esteem. It is if it's uh, controlled competence. Mm. In other words, if, so I, you if, can distinguish if, but, if what's mm. driving my competence is the kind of ego involvement we were talking about before, then indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. But there can be a more, so you think, so you could distinguish between a more exploratory form of mastery competence from an ego form? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it gets back to what, what's motivating your, uh, your activity there. Very interesting. Um, and yeah, so well, let's talk about self-esteem because I, I do actually posit the need for self-esteem as its own thing. And I've read I've read great papers you've you've written on this arguing why um, you didn't include self esteem in your model, yeah. um, and, and I, I think you've made great points. You know they're very wise and very Buddhist way of thinking about it. And um, I was wondering if you could unpack a little bit um, why you didn't include self esteem in your model, and then maybe I could try to defend why I why I did in my model. But I'd I'd love to hear some of your thinking about that. Well, self esteem gets used in some different ways. Um, when you, but typically you measure self-esteem, you're, ask, you're, you're getting at a positive self-concept that people have. Um, and there's no doubt that it, you know, it's good to have that positive view of yourself and your social relations that gets measured with self-esteem measures. But if, you have, if you're engaged in life in a way that has autonomy, if you feel connectedness with other people, if you feel effective at what you're doing, you have self-esteem. But that means it's a derivative, it's an outcome of these other satisfactions that we have in life. But if you're motivated to get self-esteem, we call that ego involvement. I mean, why am I concerned mm -hmm. about how I'm being uh, evaluated or how I'm, am I good or am I bad? Just the very fact of entering into those questions and those comparisons has moved me you know, away from a more autonomous kind of functioning. But when I'm functioning well, I'm not one, I mean, when a person is functioning well, they're not wondering, how, how am I doing? How do I compare to the others? Uh, am I great? Th those questions don't even come up because you are feeling good. So self-esteem is, is an evaluative stance with respect to yourself. I mean, this is one view of it. Uh, and that's not a basic need. It grows out of certain kind of social situations. And sometimes it's actually a harmful problem to be focused on self-esteem. Yeah, this is a really interesting question, motivation uh, versus need. I mean, I think uh, I try to make the case that I do believe self-esteem is a need. Uh, it is a fundamental need. You see you see a catastrophic uh, failures, um, a depression, et cetera, with very low levels of self-esteem. So a certain, certain minimum threshold, it, it seems to be required of a healthy self-esteem versus a narcissistic self-esteem. Um, but also I include the need for safety in my model because I think it's a need. But I, I actually, I very much take your point. I think it's an excellent point about if your if your primary motivation is self esteem and that that does maybe connote a sense of disintegration yeah. in the system to a certain degree so I absolutely agree with that. Um, and it actually, you raise an interesting question about individual differences, something I'm interested in very much. You know, people have, uh, e even in all three of your needs, some people, people vary dra dramatically the extent to which they want uh, connections, you know, in their lives, or people vary dramatically the extent they want autonomy and competence. So, um, you know, what, what have you found in, from an individual difference perspective, are there thing ones that like are the better better predictors of of things in life than others? You know, from a variation perspective. Well, well, the first thing is is that people will vary in terms of their 
self-reported preference or care about autonomy, relatedness, or competence. One of the good things about SDT is it's a functional theory. It says it doesn't matter whether you like or care about those things. If you don't have them, you show the deterioration functioning associate that the theory predicts. Or, and when you do have them, even if you say I, it doesn't matter to me, having them enhances your wellness. So this is a functional theory rather than a, a, a preference theory. And we even show that preferences don't really change those results much. Uh, there's no interaction between getting your needs met and it predicting wellness and whether that's what you thought you wanted. Um, so, you know, there's that, I think that's really important because when we're thinking about needs, we're not talking about people's values, we're talking about the requirements they have to be full functioning. By the way, just a side story, can I tell you one quick side story? Oh, please, yeah, of course, of course. In, it was somewhere around 19, I'm gonna say 72, that, you know, because you asked me about Maslow, I had read some of his books at the time. Uh, I had dropped out of college and I was living up in Cambridge and just reading a lot and, you know, working in factories. I was a factory wrecker at the time. And I read one of Maslow's books and I thought, oh, he's at Brandeis. I will go see him. Because, you know, I was a kid and I didn't know any better. Uh, so I went to over to Brandeis and I went to his office and I knocked on his door and somebody saw me knocking on his door and they said, oh, you know, uh, Dr. Maslow has passed away. Mm. So I never got to talk to him. And uh, mm. recently somebody said to me, you know, if you had gotten in, what would you have asked? <laughs> and I thought, Gee, you know, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what my young 21 year old mind would have asked at the time, but I, I clearly had questions for him. So. Um, you know, he I was love a, that. He was a figure <laughs> in my mind. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. You're 21 years old. So you liked Abraham Maslow. Uh, <laughs> and I, uh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, um, you know, what about the higher needs? Well, how come I, there aren't higher needs in your, um, in your model? Like, um, like the need for self tr transcendence or, uh, all or maybe is it because they're not needs uh, you they're, know what, they're not what, needs. What, what they, they can be outcomes of integration however in other words you know stt mm. is an organismic theory it says that the fullest functioning organism is an integrated one um and a lot of these things that we see in what you're you're calling higher needs are really uh highly integrated people um who you know are, are pursuing the things that matter to them but you have you certainly have a lot of people who are high in uh, competence, autonomy, and uh, relatedness um, who aren't motivated by transcendence. Uh, and this is Maslow's point. He actually, the end of his life, he distinguished between two kinds of self-actualizers: uh, transcending self-actualizers and non-transcending self-actualizers. You probably won't like this, Scott, but I actually think that that part of the era of humanistic psychology did humanistic psychology in. The split Tell over what, yeah. transpersonal and transcendence versus mainstream humanistic psychology, I think, really hurt that field. Hmm. And that's not to, to in any way disvalue, uh, devalue the, the idea of transcendence, but it became so central in some people's minds that they kind of kicked out the Rogerians and the other non-transcendent hmm. Humanistic psychology. I don't know if you know about the fights at the Journal of Humanistic Psychology and all of that stuff that happened at that time. But it was a sad moment, I think, for the movement of humanistic psychology, which, you know, I was not a part of. I'm only saying this as a historical note. Sure. It's, it wasn't just a pretty picture, um, what he was doing at the end of his career. Okay, well, uh, there goes my book. <laughs> no, I'm joking. There goes my book, Transcend. No, no, it, it doesn't take away at all from the importance of that topic. I'm only saying that, um, you know, it, know it, it's, a, it's a piece of a larger puzzle of a healthy organism. But when you make Yeah, it, I, and I, I agree. And uh, the, I think that they put so much stress on that, and there were some mm -hmm. more empirically minded psychologists who just couldn't go there, and they lost them from the movement. Yeah, I see. What, I really do see what you're saying, and um, yeah, I try to go to, to great pains to distinguish between healthy transcendence and unhealthy transcendence. And healthy transcendence is very much about integrating all the other needs before um, you try to kind of 
jump jump to you know being enlightened you know the i'm enlightened and you're not effect that's narcissism not transcendence you know, well, you know i've done a lot I, of work and, and not just me but people in sdt have done a lot of work on the issue of mindfulness and how mindfulness mm-hmm. relates to full yeah. functioning people i don't think yeah. of mindfulness as transcendence i think of it as being here now i think of mindfulness as really being deeply aware of what's going on in the current moment and in touch with both your inner states and with what's going on outside. It, transcendence doesn't describe that. Awareness describes that. And I think awareness is, is hugely important to autonomy. You cannot be autonomous unless you first have awareness. And so mindfulness, you know, for us plays a kind of, uh, gr- is the ground out of which autonomy best grows. I like that. You know, as like, it, it's definitely a grounding skill to have and it yeah. definitely does ground me and has been a, a saver a lifesaver yeah. for me in many instances and true, and um, true for me too you know i've had a my own involvement in in a zen practice now for some 30 years and uh and i'm wow. really you know happy when i met uh, kirk brown who brought mindfulness into the sdt framework uh, in a pretty direct yeah. way um, so I, I think it's been important for our um, theorizing i agree and and and, and self-determination theory i mean uh, major kudos the extent to which it's pervaded many other areas of psychology and and has in, uh, shown its implications in wide swaths of society. So I thought uh, for this latter part of our interview, can I go down some domains of life and kind of talk to me about the implications? So re- re- one, relationships. I mean, this is one right now during COVID, I think that people are are very much lacking in that need. I feel like that need is frustrated, yeah. you know? Can you talk a little about um, some work you've done on uh, self-determination theory and in that so domain? The first thing I want to say is we've been collecting a lot of data on need satisfaction during COVID. Um, uh, a lot of this work grows out of the, um, the group that's in Ghent, Belgium. So we have a lot of work on the Belgian population around need satisfaction on a day-to-day basis, really, over uh, the pandemic. And the relatedness need is really hurting in a lot of people, and particularly young people. And so when you look at, you know, you asked before about why are people kind of breaking out, not following social distancing rules, a lot of it is related to need frustration and particularly in a group of people Mm. uh, in a period of life where relatedness is huge. And uh, so, um, you know, first we've seen that a lot. So. Um, but anyway, what was your what was your question? That was a side one. <laughs> well, no, In that was great. How does, uh, well, how does SDT deal with relationships? You know, what are the implications of, of STD in, in the domain of relationships? Well, you know, STT has organized a, a series of mini theories. Uh, the latest mm. of those mini theories, uh, the sixth of them, is called relationship motivation theory. And mm. uh, so it's really an explanation of what what are the ingredients of a high quality relationship? And you know, one of the things we argue in SDT is you can, it's not just warmth, closeness, being nice, being supportive. Those things don't make for an intimate relationship. There also has to be autonomy support. There has to be a care about the self of the other and an interest in the promotion of this. There's got to be a kind of an agopic theme within a relationship for it to be super high quality. And that's what our data shows, which is that uh, it's only in autonomy supportive relationships that you have true intimacy. And, you know, this is kind of suggested in some other theories of relationships, but STT makes it explicit and looks at the way in which controlling motives or controlling tendencies and ego involvements really, really do create problems in relationships. And I just want to credit here, particularly Chip Nee's work, at University of Houston mm. because he's done a lot of great work in this area. This idea of su- autonomy, supportive environments is, um, has really pervaded the literature greatly, especially in the workplace. I, I've, I see it everywhere in the workplace literature, which is um, exciting, you know, that more people are talking about that. Um, did you, uh, what did you think of Dan Pink's book, Drive? Well, you know, Dan came, to, when he wrote Drive, he came to Rochester to interview Ed and me. He spent a few days Wonderful. here. That's how he got the basis for that book um you know the book basically explicates autonomy competence and he uses the term purpose as opposed to relatedness so he has autonomy i think it's autonomy mastery purpose are the three things he comes away with uh but you know there's he a, took away uh, relationships <laughs> yeah uh, but he took that away i um you know uh, 
it's become a very popular view. People oftentimes will sort of say, well, you're Pink's theory of this. Oh, that's <laughs> so, ridiculous. So, yeah. so you know, I, I get a little tweaked on that, but I actually really appreciate Dan's work on this because he helped popularize it. He helped bring some of the message of this research to the organizational field, and we want that. You know, So I think popular writers play a huge role in helping translate um, nerdy academic work like ours and self-determination theory into the practical world. So I totally appreciate the book drive. Uh, for yeah, what. because it's really, um, it, it's become a, it, it was a popular book. It, it was, it, it had a lot of implications for the workplace. A lot of people adopted in the workplace. I'm just wondering in your own, your own world, your own research, you know, how much do you intersect with, uh, the workplace? Do you, do you do consulting personally? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm going. Actually, I started a company in 2003 with Scott Rigby, who was a, a former PhD oh. student. And we still write together on issues yeah. of mindfulness and uh, uh, or and uh, human relations uh, kind of things. Um, but Scott and I started a company called Motivation Works. Uh, we uh, measure the motivational climate or the work climate within companies. Uh, we we uh, do interventions to help managers become more autonomy supportive. So, you know, very much so. We we're, we're always on the front lines of that kind of work. And it's, and it's hugely important because, you know, we spend so much of our time in our workplaces and uh, they should be places for thriving. And uh, they can be uh, under the right, uh, right circumstances. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of, I fear that a lot of workplaces still have a very outdated model of what it takes to motivate people yeah. intrinsically. Yeah. Um, they're not, they're not thinking how can we motivate people intrinsically? <laughs> I feel like they're not a lot of, a lot of companies aren't even, even thinking of that question. <laughs> There's well, like, I, how do we motivate people? I yeah. think this is relates to some of the findings we have in SDT though. When people are put under pr controlling pressures, they often respond mm -hmm. with controlling solutions for the people who are around them. And so you see within organizations, a lot of times when you have a controlling manager, They'll even say, well, it's not the way I want to be, but they're making me. And they point up above. You see this kind of downhill uh, control mm -hmm. thing go on. So, you know, changing uh, company climate not, is, a, is a big task because you, you have to do it at multiple levels of the company. You can't just be, you know, go in here and tweak one manager. It's, a, it's about a whole climate. It's about a, an atmosphere. Um, and a set yeah, of whole culture. Yeah. Mm. Well, this uh, segues into a topic I'm very much interested in: uh, education and uh, and educational culture. Um, talk about you know designing a system to get the worst out of people. <laughs> we've that's what we've done in our American education system and around the world. Um, yeah, have you? Uh, sorry, what do you say? I said yeah, really around the world. I mean, yes, in the around U.S., the world, but yeah. yes, elsewhere too. Yeah. For sure, for sure. But there's so many clear implications of your theory for the young adulthood, identity development, self-esteem, and their authenticity. Um, you know, all the things that we don't uh, focus on developing was in students that we we, we should. Um, yeah, so, what are your, some of your thoughts on uh, the, those linkages? Well, just the first thing is, is that you know, if we had a goal for schools, that their context of development, and you'd want them to be places where children are helped to flourish to become all that they can be later um, mm. and, and to be able to discover what matters to them and to develop the tools so they can pursue it. That's not at all the way schools are framing their goals. They're talking about get more STEM students, get high achievement scores on the standardized tests. For, um, you know, they, they've really lost the thread of what, what are the values and the goals that we should have in a place where we put our children for multiple hours every day. And, uh, you know, to me, the goal of school is to create a, an interested, engaged, and enabled and empowered student. And the mm. factors that would go into that are quite different than the ones that we're currently using, which are focused around evaluations, grades, and social comparisons. Well, that's, for, that's, for, that's for darn sure. Um, well, I mean, what, what, what can we do? What can, you know, how can... Well, we uh, promote this more in schools. You know, I think one of the values of psychological research is we are looking at the techniques that teachers can do within classrooms that can make them more motivating and engaging places for students. But then, you know, teachers can only do that if they themselves have the support and the uh, room for autonomy to create those kind of engaging atmospheres. So, that, you know, the research really shows that when you've got autonomy support from your principal, you can be a more engaging teacher. 
when that principal has autonomy support from their superintendent, they can have a, a better school climate. And superintendents need, of course, the support from their boards and from their governments. We have a lot of dumb policies in place in the United States and Australia and yeah. uh, in a lot of countries that have high stakes standardized testing being the gauge by which schools are judged. And this drives the worst kind of classroom behavior because it has everybody focused on a very narrow outcome. And then they have to use controlling means to get students to to meet those outcomes and everybody loses in that task. So what can we do? We can change policy. We can get rid of high stakes standardized testing right now. There's no value to it in any school. Pearson should be embarrassed that they do these things because what's happening with high stakes standardized testing is it, it, uh, it by putting high stakes behind these outcomes, it leads schools to be more uh, pressuring of students in a way that doesn't help them learn. So we're spoiling the very ingredients of, of positive learning by having these imposed score goals. And another thing I want to say is me. STEM, this focus on STEM. Everyone must be a STEM student. Well, I'm sorry, but if you look around the world, humans are a diverse lot and we need all kinds of people with all kinds of different skills and driving everybody down a narrow road for college prep in science courses is really a way of damaging the self-esteem and the motivation and the engagement of so many of our students. You know, we have to get off of these fetishes. There's not enough STEM jobs for all the people we graduate now. Uh, but even more so, there's a lot of things that students aren't learning in school that would really help them navigate life better. And instead, we're focused on giving them yet another calculus course before they leave high school. Mm. I, I don't see these things as being well thought through in terms of social policy. Yeah, it's a good point. I, 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 I do think that uh, that statistic, basic statistics should be mandatory for everyone, though, because you see a lot of people with, with no training in STEM whatsoever, um, making lots of outlandish claims and that does impact everyone, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. you know, in this climate today. Well, so you know, it's just a basic, really a good thing you know. because we face them every day. So that's a practical skill. Mm -hmm. You're reading statistics every yeah. day in the newspaper. Learning about basic financial skills would be great in high school. Um, learning about mm. things that you actually use in mathematics would be great for sure. a lot of students who aren't going that same college STEM route. We're, we're forgetting about the fact that schools should be places that help students grow and develop the skills they need in life. And instead, we're focusing them on the things that industry told somebody at some point they wanted. That's not a way yeah. to organize our educational worlds. Yeah. Yeah, so we could probably agree on the, the basics, like basic scientific reasoning, I think is important to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, but, but no, I hear you. We're, we're, we're robbing people, these kids of their autonomy. Yeah. Um, and that's, it's well, tragic. I, in the service the of trying to get yeah. them the highest scores on their STEM tests, we're driving out the arts, we're driving out the music, we're driving out the things right. that bring kids to school and have them feel at home and engaged. Uh, you know, we're, we're over testing them. We're drilling. We're just doing all the things that motivation research now for three decades or four decades has been telling us is backfiring. And the results are, are clear. I mean, this experiment's Absolutely. been going on for 30 years, the high stakes standardized testing experiment. And it's an utter failure by anybody's measurement. I challenge anybody who hears this broadcast to tell me any positive evidence they have for how high stakes standardized testing has helped our schools, our children, our teachers, or anybody, there is no evidence. There is no value. There's just a way of testing companies making money and spoiling the cultures of our schools. Mm. I don't have yeah. a strong opinion yeah, about this though. <laughs> well, there, man, there, <laughs> look, I'm right there with you. There needs to be a major overhaul. Oh, man. Have you, are you, have you made contact with the field of positive education? You know, yeah. um, there's these, yeah. And, and, and you know, in, I'd love to get your thoughts. What are, what do you think of positive psychology as a field? Because you're not actually, you know, you didn't like start off in like positive psychology, yet you've, you found yourself in, in the field of positive psychology. I mean, people in the field love you. You know, and they talk about you all the time and they, they incorporate what you're doing into the work they're doing. So I was just wondering, you know, what, what you're thinking is of that, the emergence I mean, that of that field. Institute for positive psychology in, <laughs> in Sydney. You're at, <laughs> my, oh, is that right? Is that right? Job, okay. yeah, the, the Institute at uh, Australian Catholic University is called the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education. That's mm -hmm. our, that's our. Okay. Institute. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 
Wow. Very cool. I know, SDT, but, but you did, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. SDT yeah. was around before the movement called positive psychology began. So we were, I think we already had as our central question, what are the things that help people flourish? And that is the same mm-hmm. central question that positive psychology asks. And so indeed, I think we have a lot of relationships to the scholarship and the activities of people who are in positive psychology. I I don't identify as a positive psychologist because I'm also a clinician. I'm interested in psychopathology and human degradation and human oppression, both sides of this coin, not just the flourishing, but Mm -hmm. also what are the harms? How are we doing harms to people? And self-determination theory is really a theory about both aspects of that. It gives explanations for the etiology of uh, various mental distress and disorders. It also gives uh, a map of how to help people flourish and what they need to be at their best. Absolutely. You talk about the factors that promote uh, healthy psychological and behavioral functioning. How can self-determination um, help bring peace to the world, reduce aggression, increase altruism, and bring out the best in humans? Well, we've moved a lot recently in the direction of looking at what we call pervasive environments and their effect on people. So how do the political structures and economic structures of the world have an impact on people's well-being through their basic psychological needs? So just an instance of this is that if you have a country where the wealth is distributed really unequally, we find that well-being is lower, controlling even for overall wealth, and we see that in there that's because wealth inequality has an impact on people's perceptions of autonomy and competence and relatedness. It, it directly impacts mm-hmm. their sense of the people around them, their competitiveness with them, uh, and it has an impact on well-being. So we, we're asking the question a lot now, what kind of political and economic structures are the best at fulfilling people's basic psychological needs and therefore producing well-being? And you know, some of the findings have to do with the perception that you have rights and uh, and privileges within a society and that you're not stigmatized and you're not excluded. These things matter a lot to people's well-being, again, through their basic psychological needs. Um, again, uh, the distribution of wealth matters a lot. Um, so, I th- you know, I think when we're trying to look at how can we create a good society, we have to look at both macro structures and family structures, both. It's not just... Um, you know, the local proximal influences on that. And uh, so changing the world, yeah, I mean, it's by trying to hold public policies and forms and structures to the criteria of, are they good at meeting basic psychological needs? Man, the world needs this so much right now. Yeah. Help save the world, Rich. Help save the world. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. we're all trying to do that, and I think it, I think it does matter. You know, SDT is a, is a, a theory about change, and it's we've always aimed to be very practical. So one of the good things about the theory is it's not just oh these are things predict outcomes, but we also have interventions to help increase relatedness, to help increase autonomy, to help increase feelings of competence, um, and you know, and ideas about how to make that actually happen in life. And, and of course, you know, if a theory doesn't really make a difference to society, then why have it? Uh, I mean, I, I've had some some professors who are very pure pure uh, scientists who argue uh, the opposite. They'll say a good scientist actually shouldn't get involved in in uh, applying their work. They should just try to do the best science they can do. So I, I've, I've heard it from both ends. <laughs> well, you know, I, I can get that if you're uh, if you're an astrophysicist, but if you're a medical scientist, don't you care about the implications of your findings? Aren't you trying to find the cure to this problem or that problem? If you're a psychological scientist, isn't it about the state of human beings that your inquiry is concerned? So it's not a neutral science, even if you think you're being neutral. Mm. Uh, when it has no practical value, then you're using up society's resources for something that may have no practical value. Um, so I, I, I can't agree with that. I, I think in the human sciences, we're asking questions that have import for human humanity. Uh, and we don't have all yeah. that much time to be fooling around either. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean I, look I, at the state the of, of human psychology. race yeah. and look at what we're leaving the yeah. next generation. So we have to solve some of these problems now. And we well, need I definitely feel that urgency for doing that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I definitely feel that urgency too. And I mean, that, that's my own bent as well. But I'm, I'm just telling you, like in grad school and various points in my life, when I've wanted to op- apply my work, I've gotten pushback from, uh, you know, from academics, you know, saying that that's not my business. Um, so, I mean, it's refreshing to hear what you're saying, but I'm just letting you know that's not the, the, the pervasive view. Well, the place you know, that you leave your values out is when you're doing that basic research, you try and bring a dispassionate, um, Yes. critical eye to that. And I believe that in SDT, we do that. It's not that we judge everything with a, a value lens. It's in your basic right. research, you apply the scientific method, which means you think seriously about your data, you're self-critical in it. But when you think about the purposes of why we do any of our work, you're going to leave values out of it. I, I, I don't understand that as a life position. Yeah. I hear you. Um, you. Look, you've done so much, you and you've applied this SDD theory to such diverse environments. We already talked about work organizations, education, but you've also applied it to health, sport, and exercise domain, video games, virtual environments. Yeah. Can you tell me what you're uh, ex- really excited about right now that you're working on? I know that you have a neuro lab, so you're really getting into neuroscience work. Tell me whatever to end ending this interview that you're really excited about right now that you're working mm. on. Well, you know, as you say, you know, we work on both the mechanistic end, so we're interested in the uh, neurological underpinnings of autonomous behavior and of close relationships. So that's what we're doing in our labs at Sydney. Mm. Um, but on the other end, we're interested in the macro structures, how economic structures and how wealth distribution, <laughs> uh, social policies mm. affect people's well-being, too. So uh, and everything in between. So, uh, you know, one of the things I think the values of a broad theory like SDT is it allows you to ask questions at every level of analysis, but it also then demands that you find evidence at every level of analysis that can be coordinated in uh, with the spirit of consilience. And uh, I, you know, I think that's our drive. So um, I think my problem, Scott, is that I'm interested in too much. <laughs> you know, my problem I, too, I, brother. I'm yeah. pretty passionate about a lot of things uh, within uh, within the field, but Right now, we're just finishing uh, the uh, new Oxford Handbook of Self-Determination Theory oh. Research. Uh, oh, great. Um, I'm just finishing with all the chapters in it. There's 55 chapters in that book, all on different topics associated with self-determination theory. Reading those over, I, what I'm really excited about is that there's a community out there of you know, hundreds and hundreds of psychologists who are using SDT in earnest and who are becoming better experts in all the subject areas than me or Ed or anybody else who's been there. So what I'm excited about is that there's a new generation of self-determination theories who are a lot smarter than me. <laughs> I love that. I really appreciate your humility and I appreciate just your legendary work in the field. There's no there's no other way of putting it. Uh, it was a true honor and delight for me to chat with you today. And I uh, just want to thank you so much for being on my podcast. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. I'd love to come back sometime, especially after I read the Transcendence yeah. book, because uh, then, yeah. then we can uh, have a discussion in detail and nerd out about all that. Now, now that would be so much fun. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get that shipped out to you, and, and we can I really nerd out. I myself for that task. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Rich. No, that's great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.